everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Al Pacino's Prison Scene, the podcast where we look at movies that have uh, objectively no deeper meaning, and we think about it. As always, I'm here, your host, Thomas Butler, and with me is my co-host, Jake Ferrier. Think about it. All right, and today we're going to be looking at the uh, 2010 release, Fred the Movie. Now, Jake, I'm sure as far as you know, uh, most of the movies we look at here are movies that came out when we were children. So does this movie hold uh, any significance in your childhood? You know, I never actually watched the Fred YouTube channel, um, and I don't even remember this movie coming out. What I do remember, though, is binging all three at some point when I was a little bit younger. Uh, I don't know why. Okay. Well, I'm not sure if I've actually seen the third one. I know I've seen the second one. I've definitely seen this one before, but uh, the only thing I really remembered about it was that John Cena was in it. And uh, he's a pretty prominent character and one that I will be discussing at length today. I don't know if you will. Oh, yeah. But, oh, yeah. Uh, I got some stuff to talk about John Cena. All right. But uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump into a summary here. Fred the movie, for those of you who don't know, is based off of, like Jake said, the YouTube channel Fred, which rose to prominence in 2008. And as I was reading, uh, Fred was actually the first YouTube channel to get 1 million subscribers, which I didn't know. I did not uh, know that either. So the movie is based on that. And the actor that created Fred, Lucas Cruikshank, I think that's how you say that, uh, plays Fred in the movie. It was a t- t- made-for-TV release on Nickelodeon. Which and I think this movie comes after Fred made an appearance on iCarly, but I'm not sure about that. I do remember him being on iCarly though, with Cabbage. Yeah, I remember that. So yeah. I think this is after that. But anyways, so the basic plot of the movie is there's this girl that Fred really likes. Uh, her name is Judy, and, and she's British for some reason. Yes, but he keeps saying that she has a Southern accent, which she obviously doesn't. But uh, so she's his next door neighbor and she moves away. So he wants to go and find her. And he thinks that she is his girlfriend, but she is not. Well, uh, well, yeah, uh, it's up for debate. But over the course of the movie, he goes through uh, several different locations, one being the woods, one being the bus where he meets kind of an anti version of himself called Durf. Uh, where else does he go, Jake? He goes to a uh, pet shop. Water park. Yeah. And he goes to shop. water park and gets buried in the sand. And throughout the movie, he has a lot of different delusions that are not, are very clearly not real. And uh, that's kind of where I wanted to start today. To me, it was very clear that Fred has some kind of mental issues uh, because throughout the movie, he creates these delusions. Like, for instance, the one where where his dad comes and gets him and they're in a tank going towards Judy's house to save her. So what do you think about those delusions? So, yeah, obviously he's delusional. Um, But it's interesting uh, with some of the delusions, for instance, uh, with the invisibility cloak, how the, what we see originally is that delusion. So when he has the invisibility cloak, before we even see what it really is, we see, you know, the actual invisibility cloak working. He turns it on, he has this little, a little skit, this little sideshow thing that he does. And this happens several times. You know, this happens at the water park also uh, when Judy's drowning. Um, So it's interesting that that the delusion happens first, and then we see reality. And uh, that's kind of what I think, you know, maybe not the deeper meaning, but Fred seems to have be losing his grip on reality, at least in my head. Uh, obviously he didn't have his father growing up and uh, John Cena is the representation of that, which John Cena's famous catchphrase is can't, you can't see me. So that to me emphasizes the fact that John Cena is not real. And Fred is kind of living in this state of imaginary. And yeah. another thing that Fred does a lot, in addition to the delusions is he uh, breaks the fourth wall and talks directly to the audience. But one thing that I'd noticed was that he only does that when he's in his house. Yes. Um, and, and speaking about that, it's, I, I was watching the beginning of the movie, and it's the introduction where he's kind of describing, you know, who he is, what he is, and all that stuff. And he's looking into the camera, but then there is a shot um, that kind of happens behind his 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 body. You know, it kind of happens behind him, and it's almost like a surveillance camera. You know, because he, he's still yeah. talking to that one spot where he was 
but we see, you know, this angle from behind. We don't see his face, we just see his back, which adds, um, it, it kind of adds to, like, the disconnect that he has between reality and, you know, his, his delusions. Right. And so what I think is going on here, I think Fred suffers from a case of arrested development uh, as a response to him not having his father or his father leaving at an early age. Now, what arrested development is, is arrested development can result from trauma, grief, or neglect. It may occur in a, when a child, preteen, or adolescent is subject to an experience that they are unable to resolve. In Fred's case, this would be him losing his father. And it, and if a child does not get the nurturing that, that they require, then the psychological development may not move ahead and they could get stuck. This is why I think Fred um, acts the way that he does, but also is the way is the reason for why his voice is so high pitched as it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think I agree. I thought you were talking about the show for a second. I was like, okay, I don't know. This has to do with. You know, know, yeah. and then, the actual psychological term arrested development yes it is also a tv show starring jason bateman which is a very good show i agree 100 percent um and, and talking about you know this mental illness i was i was thinking that he, he might be um schizophrenic you know just because of these delusions they they appear to be very real to him right you know um and so it's not just you know and a thought that he has but it it's you know, something that, that takes place in his mind and he acts on it. Yeah. And I think uh, him being schizophrenic, I think one of the main points that could be attributed to that is his, his interactions with Durf. Because when we first meet Durf, it's not very clear that he's not a real person. But then all of a sudden, you know, it cuts to Fred sitting to, by himself on the bus talking to nobody. But yeah. Durf shows up a few times throughout the movie. So I thought that maybe Durf because he's kind of the antithesis to Fred, I thought that maybe Durf was maybe Fred's mind trying to ground him in reality. Yeah, yeah. And I think that would also factor in because of the colors that they wear. Obviously, Fred is wearing yellow a lot. And Very Durf, bright his main color was black, yeah. Yeah, you know, speaking of Durf, um, I agree that he's that double, um, that, you know, the character that kind of grounds um, Fred... But he also kind of feels like a representative of what Fred wants, a, a non-conscious representative. Because in their conversation, you know, Durf kind of, he talks about things that Fred is thinking but doesn't say. For instance, um, when Fred talks about how Judy is his girlfriend, Durf makes the comment of, she's not your girlfriend. Right. And so this is something that Fred had already been thinking, but hadn't been actualized vocally. And so now that Durf had said that, he had said the non-conscious, what Fred didn't want to accept, you know, that kind of becomes reality. Yeah. And something that I kind of think goes along with that a little bit is throughout almost the entirety of the movie, Fred is wearing suspenders, even when he is in, the, in bathtub. the bathtub. Yep. Yeah. So what I thought that maybe that was trying to say was that Fred uh, needs a support system and he's trying to hold himself up. And that's why he has to constantly wear those suspenders. So that was kind of Durf maybe making him uh, cut loose on the suspenders a little bit. Yeah, and it also seems that um, Durf might be like um, Fred's like moral compass. Um, it seems that Fred kind of suffers from a bit of amoralization just in the sense that he does what he wants um, right. without any, you know, thought to what's happening around him. Um, and then this goes back to the delusions. So not only is he amoral in that sense, but it's these, these delusions that create that amorality. So there's no reason for there to be, for there to be amorality but because of those delusions, they are uh, fostered. And one example of this is when they are in the pet shop and he sees the squirrels right. um, or the papillons and he, he wants to take one because he thinks that Judy would like that. So there's no real even there's not even any real evidence, any concrete evidence based on his actions here, but it's simply what he thinks. And so, you know, there is no filter for his actions. 
um, to even think about, you know, is this a good idea? Is this right? Should I be doing this? It, no, it's just, I'm going to do this. Yeah, he doesn't really think about uh, how his actions have consequences. And that also goes back to further earlier in the movie when he's trying to dig a hole to get into uh, Judy's yard, which she has moved by that point, but Fred does not know this. And he strikes a, an electrical cord. And he holds it there for a little bit because he thinks it feels cool to be electrocuted, I guess. But when he does that, it shorts out the power throughout the neighborhood. And Kevin, who is his neighbor across the street, falls on the treadmill and breaks his arm, which Fred obviously well, did not know that was happening. Yeah, but Kevin, but Kevin is Kevin. Who cares about Kevin? Kevin's a jerk. But that still speaks to Fred's amorality. Also, I'm not sure that Kevin actually is a jerk. I think he just wants to be Fred's friend, but because... Uh, kind of the same reasons that Fred acts the way he does. Uh, Kevin has his own problems with his own father because when they're in the car, when F Kevin and his mom are in the car and they're driving past Fred several times and Kevin keeps trying to get his mom to go back to Fred, he tells his mom, uh, if you don't do it, I'm going to tell dad. And then she says, oh, no, don't tell your father. So Kevin obviously also has an unhealthy relationship with his dad. Potentially, maybe he is abusive. And that is why Kevin acts the way that he does. Yeah, and, and there's also another scene when uh, Fred is Fred is first walking. When he first leaves his house, he's riding along, or Kevin is on the bike, riding along next to Fred. So there's another example of that. And yeah, I would agree with that he also has an unhealthy relationship with his parents. And it's also interesting to see that the only adult characters we see, the only adult parents we see, um, their relationship with their children is that unhealthy relationship. You know, full of just bad tendencies well because we only see kevin's mom and fred's mom right do we see anyone else yeah we see yeah we see kevin's mom fred's mom and then dad john cena oh right okay well uh, yeah also talking about the unhealthy relationships uh, fred's mom clearly doesn't want anything to do with them because every time she comes home she just goes straight to take a nap i'm taking a nap yeah right so she obviously doesn't care for Fred, and Fred is being neglected very clearly. Yeah. yeah. But when at the end of the movie, when Fred decides to th throw his uh, fake party, and he tells his mom that he invited hundreds of people, she seems to be very proud of him. So maybe she thought that by neglecting him, she was teaching him to fend for himself, and she's proud because he finally did that. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that's possible. I hadn't thought about that. Or, or but, maybe she's just a party animal because, you know, she has a good time. And that's why she always has to take a nap? Yeah. Which, speaking of parents, um, John Cena, th this entire movie, they're very problematic. Um, but yeah, John Cena has his, his character, the dad, has this weird, if, if he is real, like, we, like we've talked about, he has this weird relationship um, with Fred. It's very... It seems like it's coming from a place of love, right? At the end of the day, that is what we see. We see this, you know, um, we see him, we see John Cena caring for Fred, but it's always very aggressive, you know, and very physical. I, You know, the joke, it, it is a joke because he is, you know, Fred's dad and John Cena is a wrestler. Um, but as far as actual parenting goes, you know, John Cena is always yelling at Fred. Um, and then, you know, their first interaction, he's putting him in a chokehold. He's throwing Fred on the table, you know. And there's this very, you know, intense emotion. And then he switches from being, you know, this aggressive father figure to being very kind and sweethearted. He, he goes, he goes like, oh, you got a little schmutz on your face. You know, yeah. so he, that, that switch, that instability... Um, is also, you know, very hard to, I don't want to say predict from Fred's point of view, but it is kind of like, okay, what do I expect? You know, he's constantly having to adapt in order to survive this environment. Are you saying Fred has to adapt? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I think part of that goes back to, which I am saying that with, pretty much without a doubt that John Cena is not real. I don't know if you agree with that or not. But uh, I would say that because he's not real, John Cena represents what Fred perceives to be like the ideal father 
So that's why he's so strong and muscular, and that's why he treats Fred the way he does. Like you're saying, he yells at him because, you know, a father needs to be stern, but then he's also very compassionate because the father needs to care for his son. Yeah. And I think that comes from, I think that comes from Fred not knowing what a father should be like. Yeah. So I I, I do, the more we talk about Fred's dad, the more I want to know about Fred's dad. Which I don't remember. I feel like John Cena comes back in the other two, but I don't know yeah, if it's proven yeah, yeah. that he's the father or not. But there is that line at the very end when they're zooming in on uh, Judy's new house and there's that guy on the toilet. Fred's mom says, uh, oh yeah, I used to date that guy, you know, however long ago. So when I watched, when I saw that originally, when this first came out, I assumed that that meant that guy on the toilet was Fred's dad. Yeah. I mean, possibly, but but... I think I think what the biggest piece of evidence for for Fred's dad, John Cena, not being real is that so at the day after the party, um, I think I think it's the day after the party. Is this the day after the fake party? Yes. There is a scene where um, Fred's mom walks in and she's talking to Fred about it and then she leaves and John Cena is in the room. But there oh, is, she, yeah. But there is no mention whatsoever of, you know, from the mom about him, right? Or or even or even Fred, because every time Fred sees his dad, John Cena, he's always like, "Dad, what are you doing here?" And that even yeah. happens in that scene, but it's after the mom has left. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Um... You know, kind of, I'm going to backtrack a little bit to earlier in the conversation when you brought up that he might be uh, schizophrenic. Uh, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but when after the fake party and Fred has stayed up all night editing the video to look like it has had a cool time, uh, he has an argument with himself that to me seemed like it was an allusion to the Lord of the Rings when Gollum, in the Two Towers, when Gollum uh, argues with himself about whether or not he should kill Bubba Baggins or he should follow him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that uh, plays into the schizophrenic aspect of Fred's personality. He also, um, you know, I, I don't, obviously we're not experts in psychology or anything like that, but he also kind of displays um, evidence and symptoms for, you know, um, possibly autism and possibly bipolar type one. Um, the, the, the temper tantrum he has I think I think autism is a little bit less prevalent, but the temper tantrum he has is um, very characteristic of someone with autism, especially younger children, just because you know, especially men um, who who have these trouble these troubles identifying you know um, social cues and facial structures, and a lot of times when they have a temper tantrum, it looks like you know, that insane attack where he's destroying everything, he's screaming, um, and he's ripping up all the couches and stuff. But on the opposite end of that, afterwards, he is very calm, you know, which which might suggest a, a bit of bipolarism because he has this insane manic episode and he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't crash necessarily, but then he, he comes out of it and it's the very opposite of what he had been doing. He's very calm and he, he's cleaning. Yeah. And I think that goes back to the uh, arrested development that I was talking about earlier because he's missing that part, like the father figure in his life, that all of these, that he's mentally unstable, basically. He, has, he hasn't developed properly, so he's developed these uh, psychological issues, you know. And it's possible, speak, and it's possible, you know, he hasn't developed this arrested development. It's possible that that is where this amoralism comes from. Not necessarily that in his soul, in his mind, he is amoral. Not necessarily that he just doesn't care, but it's possible that he just doesn't know. He doesn't know the right and wrong because he hasn't been taught that. Right. And uh, I don't know if this really factors into the amoralism at all. But the only other uh, instance we see of from Fred's childhood is that kid that uh, gets lost in the woods. I'm going to look up his name real quick, but I'm going to keep talking while I'm doing it. So that way 
the audio what isn't is uh, little Eddie Weiss. Is that what it is? Evan, Evan, little Evan, Evan Weiss. Weiss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when when they're little, uh, Fred is playing with this kid named Evan Weiss, and he throws a ball into the woods, and Evan Weiss runs into the woods, and it's kind of become this. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you want to say legend, but it's this, it's this thing in the town that everyone seems to know about that little Evan Weiss uh, ran into the woods and never came back. So that either a could be just Fred's delusions and that he makes it a big deal, and so that since we experience this movie through. E- Fred, everyone else makes it a big deal. Yeah. But regardless, this thing happened when he was a child and he lost what was potentially his only friend because in the movie it doesn't seem like he has very many, if any, friends other than uh, his neighbor, who he's quite oblivious to. What was her name? Played by Bertha. Uh, uh, Bertha, yeah. Well, and originally, speaking of Bertha, originally when I was watching the movie, I was questioning whether or not Bertha was real. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because he, he, they have the same interactions, you know, as Fred and John Cena. It's always only them two. But near the end of the movie, we, we see she's interacting with other people. So, you know, she does end up being real. Maybe Fred's delusions were manifesting themselves in reality. This is possible. Because I know John Cena is back in the second one. So if John Cena is real in the second one, then I'm going to go with that. But uh, what I was saying about Evan Weiss is that's another one of the jokes that uh, repeats throughout the movie is that thing about the woods. And every time they say little Evan, Evan Weiss, Weiss. Uh, every time they say the woods, you hear like a wolf howl. And Fred yeah. is afraid that if he goes in the woods, he won't ever come back. Yeah. And you know, so I, I was wondering if you thought that that uh, was representative of anything. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with the, the fact that that was possibly his only friend. Um, and, and that that this may signify because because correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason he goes into the woods is because aren't they playing like catch or something? They're playing with like yeah. a ball. Yeah, with their children. Yeah, Fred, Fred over overthrows it. Yeah, right. Which leads Evan Weiss to go into the woods, and this can be seen as a failure. He failed to throw the ball correctly to Evan Weiss. And throughout the entire movie, Fred has these self-confidence issues. You know, he's got problems. He's always like, oh, what if I can't do this? And this this really happens a lot in the second movie. Um, but yeah, he, he has these, these struggle with self-confidence. So, uh, you know, you're saying this is only Fred, but I wonder if, um, you know, that failure is kind of also another thing that kind of led to this, to his character being afraid of that failure. Right, and it stunted his growth emotionally. I mean, that's definitely possible, especially if his mom uh, acted like she does in this movie throughout the, his younger life if she was never really supportive of him. I would say that's yeah. definitely a possibility. But also, when he goes into the woods, he has a conversation with a deer, uh, which, you know, obviously that's another delusion. But... Yes, but it's also it's also very fake. Like, 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 um, obviously fake. And a lot of times in movies, they will kind of like play around and try to make it look real. But the way, right, the way in this movie, it's like, okay, that's obviously fake. Yeah. And, you know, maybe, doesn't he scare the deer away when he starts singing? Um, he does something that gets the deer away well because i know right after the deer leaves uh evan weiss comes up and he's like friend i got the ball but uh i'm not sure if that scared away the deer if it was fred singing but if it was fred singing then i think that like accents the uh whole delusional thing because throughout the movie fred is saying how he is such a good singer when and it keeps cutting to him singing uh somebody called 911 something something dance floor whatever that song is and he is very clearly not a good singer and i mean obviously that's played for comedic effect but the fact that it, he is singing that song and later in the movie cannot remember what number he's supposed to call i think it, it kind of says something because you know 911 that's an emergency number and he's saying somebody called 911 so i think you know maybe subconsciously that is fred trying to call for help that's a good thought um 
Huh, that's a good thought, but I don't know if I would agree with that 100%, um, because those seem to be more of flashbacks, whereas there are a few music, musical numbers in the film that, that Fred is singing in, and that singing is um, that singing is a lot better. Well, but those, those are, are all delusions. Right? Yeah, it's, it's but they are... Judy. Okay, so you're saying, for instance... There's a there's an inner Fred that is in the um, the sunken place that is trying to escape. Is that what you're kind of referring? Maybe, like saying? maybe yeah, maybe that's like that's Durf. You know, like like Fred Fred subconsciously knows that there is something wrong with him, but he can't address it because he doesn't have anyone in his life to talk to. And About, you know, yeah. yeah. And he he thinks that everybody hates him, and that's you know that's why he throws the fake party, and he gives everyone disinvitations. But then when he gives Bertha her disinvitation, and he realizes that Bertha was not invited to Judy's party either, then you know he kind of that's the first instance of the movie where we see him feel remorse, you know, and he's he's starts to act morally, and he's like, well, I mean, you can come if you want. So now now he has somebody to talk to. Yeah, and I and I would say on that that I feel as if when he's with Bertha, he's the most normal. Now, obviously, he's not normal by any means, any stretch of the imagination at all, any of the time. But yeah, he does he does develop that morality more, you know, that grounding more when he is with Bertha. Um, so about about the party, you know, I think you know, obviously, Fred goes to Judy's house, and then when he gets there. Judy has been has been throwing a party and he was not invited and then he throws up sardines all over her and everybody, you know, makes a big fuss about it. And yeah. then he decides to throw his fake party, but film it in a way that it seems that several people were there. And I think this, you know, this is obviously the um, recurring image or not recurring image, but the recurring theme that, you know, of Fred's false reality because this party is not real but he wants everyone to think it's real yeah and perhaps you know this is fred finally acknowledging that the realities that he lives in his head and that he creates for himself are false and it's time for him to come back to the real world yeah although he successfully tricks everyone into thinking that the party was real. So maybe he's just, he's dragging everyone into his false realities. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I gotta, I gotta give it to him. He does a great job at filming this party. Oh yeah. Most definitely. It, it, it totally looks real. Um, but it's also interesting. So, so, so when he's at, um, Judy's house, it almost seems as if everyone is there, right? Like, like yeah. it feels like everybody, because I think I think when we when we go back and we after his fake party, we see all everybody like, oh, I wasn't I wasn't invited to Fred's party. I wish I could have been there, um, which nobody talks about to anybody. They all just think that nobody was there. Like yeah. like like I'm sitting next to you and I'm like, dude, I wish I could have gone to Fred's party, and you're like, oh, me too. And then like this chain of like, oh, nobody went. Well, obviously, people were disinvited. So people know that, like, they weren't allowed to go. But, you know, in those in those clips at the end, nobody mentions the disinvitations. So, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's like this, this sense of, well, I want to belong, so I'm just going to go along with what everyone else is saying. Yeah. Although there is, that, there is that one kid that lies and is like, yeah, dude, I was at Fred's party. He was sick. He threw up on me. You know, so oh, yeah, everyone yeah. everyone wasn't like, oh, man. <clears throat> yeah, well, this kind of plays into the idea of well, this could this could be a more positive light. Is this kind of plays into the idea of like groupthink? You know, everybody wants to be a part of that group, including Fred. Yeah, um, and the, I would say the only character that doesn't is Bertha and Durf, but you know, Durf isn't really whatever. Um, so so he so he wants to be a part of that group. He has fallen prey to this group thing, this conformity, but he also never is a part of that group. You know, he's right. always striving to be in it, but he never is. Um, and then 
you know, he he has the he has the ability. You know, he invites everybody and then he disinvites them. So it is kind of this push and pull um, that, that may go deeper into, you know, um, the difference between his external self and his internal self, you know, the non-conscious, that, that um, tug of war, that he does want to be a part of this group, but he doesn't. Yeah, uh, I think that goes back to, you know, what we were talking about and him having psychological issues. Like, he wants one thing, but then when he realizes he can't have that thing, then he like completely overcorrects and goes the opposite direction and says nobody can come to anything, which is not the logical or rational response. But it ultimately doesn't really have any bearing on the story or the plot that he throws that fake party because Judy uh, felt bad for Fred in the first place and was going to come yeah. over anyways. So him throwing that fake party did not really do anything to help or hurt him, I don't think. Well, I know she mentions that she didn't invite Fred to her party. But I don't think she mentions not being invited to Fred's party. No, I don't think she does either. And at the end, you know, what the, it, the movie ends with her, with Judy coming up to Fred's house. And you're yeah. saying, like, hey, whatever, I feel bad. Uh, but then she, they, Fred invites her inside to sing a duet, correct? No, 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 no. She asks if she can come in. Okay. So she asks so... if she can... and, and not only that, number one, she's dressed up for whatever reason. You know, there's right. that discussion of, like, well, I guess she missed school, or, or Fred had missed school that day. But still, she's dressed up, you know, in, in a nice dress and high heel uh, shoes. Um, and then we have Fred, who's dressed in his pajamas or loungewear, as he calls it. He's wearing camo. Yes. Um, so, he, so he's wearing that, and then she asks, like, like, can we sing together? Like, can I come in and we can sing together? You know, and everybody has everybody can do what they want, right? Do what you want, but it is, you know, that that's odd. I wouldn't. I don't. I don't know. That's odd, especially considering you know their relationship. They haven't had a relationship. They're not necessarily friends or whatever. Um, and 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 I think it goes back to that delusion where the entire goal of the movie is to get together with Judy so that they can sing. Yeah, and it's very coincidental. That that she would come over and ask to sing. Well, this does happen in Fred's house, and as we've previously established, uh, things that happen in Fred's house are not usually what they seem. Like you know, we have him talking to the camera, breaking the fourth wall. We have his father, you know, which is, I think is very clearly not real. And then we have you know the party, which did actually happen, but through everyone else's perception, was not real. So you, the argument could be made that this Judy coming to Fred's house is not actually real either. And I think the fact that he's wearing uh, camouflage would speak to this because two earlier instances of camouflage is A, when he has the uh, in invisibility cloak, and then B, um, when his dad comes to get him and they go to save Judy in the tent. And he's wearing camo then too. Yeah. So I would almost agree with that except for the fact that kevin is in the background witnessing this take place and so that's where it kind of throws a hole in that um but it could be saved you're, you're mentioning this idea that you know uh fred's internal you know will i guess what he wants kind of manifests itself in reality right. um so, you know, and there there are a few things that, that, that happen that Fred hasn't necessarily caused, um, but kind of coincidentally, um, one of them being when um, he, he's, he's digging the tunnel and he touches the electrical cords or the wires or whatever, and it, you know, makes Kevin fall and break his arm, um, which, you know, that seems pretty divine. 
how is it possible that that you know the one chord or whatever knocks down the whole transformer? But later, later when he's walking, when he leaves his house, Kevin's riding next to him. Um, Fred says, "I bet God pushed you down because He hates the way you sing." Yeah, which it, which is a bit interesting. You know, this this it reminded me of of Steve, Steve Buscemi's quote from Spy Kids. You know, it was like, "Do you ever wonder if God um, stays in heaven because he's a of creation?" Or yeah, yeah, looks down. Um, but but it kind of plays into this manifestation where, you know, Fred is the center of this movie. He breaks the fourth wall all the time. You know, this is his life, his actions that we're looking at. So it begs the question of, you know, if he is the creator of his own reality, you know, if he is the one that is causing this, if he is the one where his delusions are manifesting itself in reality. I mean, I would say there actually is, you know, some evidence to support that because whether everyone else can see them or not, uh, the things that Fred imagined most oftentimes do have an impact yes. on the real world. Yeah. Like, for instance, when he dreams about getting the squirrel, I, that's before he goes into the pet shop, isn't it? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, at one point in the movie, he dreams that he's on he's on the bus and he has this delusion that this lady is handing out a free puppy, which I mean, he calls them squirrels. But so this woman hands him the squirrel and he goes and gives it to Judy. And then later in the movie, he goes into a pet shop where he actually finds these squirrels. And obviously, he doesn't end up with one, but it did almost happen. And there's also another one. This is a, this one's a lot more subtle. Um, and I could totally be reading into this, but he's at the water park, right? And he gets buried in the sand. And at the at, there's this whole little scene where everyone's running, you know, and then there's a bunch of people running and they kick his or, or Kevin kicks his head, right? And his head and his head flies back. But when he snaps out of that delusion, his head is back. Right. So it's a lot more subtle, but it is still kind of this. This action has taken place in his head. It has taken place internally, and it presents itself externally. It has a yeah. real reaction on his body. Well, that's. To, I think that's because to Fred, these things are real. Which you know, it makes it makes it. That's what makes it the, the delusion. Is because not only can no one else see what's happening, so Fred is crazy. These things actually have a physical impact on him. Yeah, and something I was thinking about, um, going going back to uh, little Evan Weiss. So the ball that he loses, the ball that Fred throws in, and this you know this again, it's one of those things that's like can totally be apophenic. Um, but the ball is red, right? That he throws, that he fails with, you know, that first instance we see. But also at the beginning of the movie, in the in the little montage of bits that he's doing, the balls that Kevin is throwing are also red, and he is it backed up ball. against yeah. the wall. He's backed up against the wall, and he's being defeated. So red is a symbol of defeat. Is there anywhere? Else, do you remember if there's anywhere else where we see red? I think Kevin wears red a lot. I think his yeah. hat is red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting. I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't pick up on that, but that, that I would say there probably is a theme of color in this movie because I mean, you know, pretty much every, almost everything Fred wears is, is yellow. yellow and gray. Um, which let me, let me see. I wonder what, what is, what does the color yellow signify? Well, I would, I would think like happiness and joy, but the fact that it's yellow and gray together, kind of, I think, fits with what we've been saying about him having being kind of schizophrenic. You oh, know, like the okay. yellow contrast with the gray. Yeah, this is interesting. So on one hand, yellow stands for freshness, happiness, positivity, clarity, energy, optimism, you know, that kind of stuff that, that Fred externally portrays, right? We see these things happening. We see him being like this, but 
So it says a dull or dingy yellow, which it kind of gives that color with being being contrasted with the gray represents cowardice uh, and deceit, um, caution, sickness, and jealousy. Yeah, like you're like a yellow belly. Yeah, yes, yellow bellied coward. Which is what we see, you know. So we we have Fred's actions, right? That that exemplify that bright yellow. But we also see what he's really going through is that dull yellow. Well, and I would say he does exhibit cowardice throughout the movie. Like, I mean, he talks a big game to Kevin, but when it comes to facing his own pitfalls, like little Evan Weiss being trapped in the woods, he yeah. almost can't bring himself to do it. Yeah. And the only reason he does is to get to Judy. But um, I was thinking when you were talking about that, why would Evan Weiss stay in the woods do you what do you think it would be because he was waiting for fred to come back so he could tell him that he got the ball yeah that, like, that, that was something i was thinking about like like he like the woods are not very big they're like no. not even woods really it's like a like a small well, like yeah it's like it's like a suburban neighborhood like yeah. you see a, a, a topographical map like several times throughout the movie so it's very clear that they're not big and then when Fred comes in the woods, Evan Weiss tells him, uh, "Tell my parents that I'm okay." And he could he could very easily, you know, leave and go back home. Yeah. And they, the the yeah. only thing the only thing that I think keeps me from saying that he wasn't real and he's just another one of uh, Fred's delusions is that multiple people throughout the movie know about Same. Evan Weiss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that is the actual Evan Weiss. Um, but you know, other than symbolically for Fred, I don't know why he would stay in the woods. It there, there might be, it still might be a manifestation because when he's at the dam right before the woods, he's talking to that guy, right? Which I think this scene represents uh, this entire movie thematically the best, which I'll get to. But the, the the forest and what happened to Evan Weiss kind of represents, like I said, represents the failure, yes. But then the effect of that is that, you know, Fred is kind of reserved to face the woods again. He He's, he's afraid to face that failure again right so right. it might be so it still might be a manifestation of you know that that fright of um of facing that fear i mean i can see that and we definitely don't see evan weiss more than uh, twice in the film so you know he's he's not really like playing that big of a role and I mean, obviously, him being in the woods was there for a comedy, but then Fred just leaves him. So you know, even if if he is real, and then like Fred found this guy who has haunted him forever because of the actions that he did so many years ago, but uh, he still doesn't confront it. He just he leaves Evan Weiss there. Yeah, who who mentions Evan Weiss? Well, the I guy at the dam does, and I think someone else does. I, I think his mom says something about it too. Um, but or or his dad maybe. Well, but his dad is not right. Real. Right, and even if it was his mom, you know, she might be not necessarily an enabler, but a passive acceptor of kind of Fred. So right. even if even if she was like a little Evan Weiss, that may have just been a, a, a just a thought that she just said, right? That, that she paid no attention to Fred and what he was saying, but you know just ignoring it. And if it was if it was John Cena, well, John Cena, like you said, sta stands for the representative father figure that Fred wishes he had, had wishes he had. So. You know, Fred unconsciously exhibits you know the the forest and and Evan Weiss as an obstacle and this failure that he, he needs to face. 
um, so it's holding him back. But he also needs that motivation from the father figure, from John Cena, to get past that. Right. But I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't know because the fact that he doesn't confront Evan or help Evan in the woods is 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 sticking with me. Because whether he's real or whether he's a manifestation, for the purposes of Fred's arc in the film, I feel like he needs to address that if what he's running from is that failure from so many years ago. So the fact that he doesn't, you know, I he, I feel like he hasn't really learned anything. But at the same time, I think, you know, we meet Durf again later, like after that. So maybe that uh, second... Durf, the second time he gets on the bus again, and he's camping out, we meet him but, there, too. But that was after the woods, right? I think so. Well, I either think. way, I think that second meeting with Durf kind of signals a change in Fred, because I, I think... Well, no, he hasn't made it to the party at that point. But Fred this still does change when he... You know, since goes to give Bertha the disinvitation, and yeah. he, she's like, "Oh, well, I wasn't invited." So maybe subconsciously, Evan Weiss brought back this feeling of failure, and uh, when he gave Bertha the disinvitation, he felt that he had failed her, yeah. and then that was why he invites her to come over to his house and to the party. Yeah, or or so yes, um, it's also. Maybe, so let's say um, Evan Weiss was real, right? Um, I feel like Evan Weiss was somebody who Fred possibly could have relied on, right? So he hasn't had anybody since then because he lost Evan Weiss or whatever. But then, yeah, he meets Bertha, and the the relationship that they kind of have, you know, where it seems like they could become close friends, you know, with that emotional uh, vulnerability, you know, that kind of scared him. And so we, we see him kind of pushing her away at the beginning. You're not, not really wanting anything to do with her because there was that emotional vulnerability. And then when he finally, you know, can accept that is when he disinvites her and then invites her. Right. You know, I, I think, I think there's a lot to that. And I think that, you know, covers, Pretty much, you know, the whole theme of the film was that Fred that had to had to come over himself and realize that you know you can't live in a false reality. Yeah, well, so I would agree with that, <clears throat> and it kind of, you know, Fred is displaying a bit of um, a Kierkegaard and despair, you know, in the sense of you know he is not he is not externally representing himself from the internal so he's he's acting against what he should be right and so right. i think i think the theme of the movie and in my opinion can go back to one scene it all revolves around this one scene um and even if this is a manifestation um when he's at the dam and he's talking to the dam guy you know great character hilarious character i think but, you know, he, he, he mentions a little Evan Weiss, and we have a little spooky, like, bleh! Right. And he's kind of, and the damn guy's kind of poking fun at him. He's like, what, you gonna go home to your mama? And the whole thing. And then he talks about, you gotta grow up and, be, and become a man, which can go back to John Cena's entire character. But then he says, who are you? So I think the yeah. theme of the movie is asking this question. You know, what kind of man are you? Who are you going to be? I Yeah. No, I, I would agree with that. But, you know, Fred, for pretty much the entirety of the movie, acts like a coward. So I don't think Fred learns to be a better man throughout the film. Which, you know, the, with the question, who are you? You don't have to be a good person. Fred's yeah. not necessarily a good person. He's just he's Fred, you know. Yeah. Well, I think, and I think that maybe. Um, so we kind of see Fred fighting this entire way, um, 
And so, you know, at the end of the, at the end of the movie, you're right. There is he doesn't grow a whole lot. But maybe that's because he didn't he didn't. There's a lot of growing as a person that he needs to do. But character stru- structurally, character characteristically wise, you know, he kind of accepts what he is. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, maybe that's it. He has to, he had to learn to accept who he was. And he did that through his manifest, manifestations of these delusional characters and scenarios that could never actually happen. Which, I mean, and ultimately, it led him to his goal of getting to, to sing with uh, Judy. So, I mean, it worked. Yeah, it worked. Um, but it's also just Judy or it's just Bertha, you know, these interactions or just Kevin. Um, and it never, so he, he really is trying to, you know, conform, which, you know, like I said, I feel like goes against his type. Cause I don't think he, be- I don't think he belongs in that group whatsoever. Um, so that defiance of conformity that he has to learn the hard way. You know, he gets bullied a whole lot, especially at the party, but he learns that the hard way and he, he gets the, the, the one that he wants, you know, not this entire group, but rather one person that he's, you know, chasing after. Right. Well, I think uh, that's a good place to, you know, wrap this up. Unless you have any extra well, thoughts. It, yes. Can we talk about how racist Fred is? Are you talking about the, the Chinese people? So, so okay. Not only the Chinese people, right? I dug all the way to China. Oh, that Mexican okay. guy. And and the Mexican guy, which this is interesting. So Fred keeps calling the Mexican guy a spaceman, which another word for spaceman is alien. Yeah. And an alien, at least in political terms, is an illegal immigrant. Right. So I mean, I just I just wanted to put that out there. It's a lot of commentary to be in Fred the movie. Yeah, and then which, like which almost... actually, from Fred's perspective, the immigrants and illegal. I mean, everyone in this movie I would assume is legal, but from Fred's perspective, the immigrants are taking over his life. Because... Yes, and that's that's what, that's what I would say. Like on the bus. So he exists as a very um, modern person. He, he he seems to be a straight white male living in a middle class suburbia, right? Right. And so so we have these run-ins. Everybody on the bus kind of exists on the margins. We have another Asian lady. We have this old weird guy. You know, there's another Mexican. There's a black guy. You know, so all all these. You know, other 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 people, other other types of people, are kind of existing, and they're they're standing in his way of achieving what he wants to. And then at the laundromat, it's the it's the black guy, which love him, oh, great character. Shout out the laundromat. He's like, uh uh-uh, uh, no, and he kicks him out. But that's another obstacle, right? Um, so all the all the obstacles that he has with people besides Kevin, um. Are are these, you know, marginalized minor uh, people? Yeah, you know, and maybe uh, since Fred is delusional, and we have clearly established he's not in the right mind, maybe the commentary of this movie is saying that you know we need to treat everyone better because not only is Fred, you know looked down upon and beat up by everyone else throughout the movie when really he just wanted to have fun with all of them. Fred isn't really nice to everyone else either until that end meeting with Bertha when he invites her to his party. Yeah. You know, then we see that everyone wanted to come to Fred's party because it was so fun. So maybe, maybe the moral of this story is that we need to treat each other better. Uh, yeah. You know what? Yeah. But really what I think it's about, I think this is a journey of self-discovery, ultimately. Yeah. It's all about finding yourself. I mean, isn't everything about self-discovery? 
it absolutely is. Okay, well, I think that's uh, that's all we have on uh, Fred the movie. The last thing I want to say is that nobody blew up in this movie, so it gets a zero out of five for me. I might give it, I might give it a one, because we do have that one scene where he has that temper changer. Maybe a point five. Okay, that's so kind we, of an emotional blow up. We have an emotional blow up, but no physical explosions. Uh, Jake, do you want to tell them where they can send us an email or find us on Twitter if they have any suggestions for movies we should watch? Yeah, if you got any questions, comments, cries of outrage, recommendations of something you want to see. You can tweet us at PacinoPod, or you can shoot us an email at PacinoPodcast at gmail.com. Okay, guys, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, Please come back for the next one. I'm not sure what we're going to be doing yet, but it's going to be just as good, if not better, than this. So I'm going to leave you with a stout and sauerkraut, and I will see you next time. Stout and sauerkraut.